Presbyterian Baptist Church. You can take your Bibles and find John chapter number 3, please. And we are looking at 1 through 14. Verse 1, please join me. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, master, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs, miracles, supernatural things that you do unless God is with him. And then Jesus interrupts him or lets him finish without a question and says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This must be incredibly important. For this to be the single thing that he says to Nicodemus after Nicodemus acknowledging that he is a teacher come from God. This is what Nicodemus needed to hear. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? To which Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So it was see, and now it's enter. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Third time. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Jesus is saying that today. Jesus is screaming that in this auditorium this morning. To each and every single person in these pews, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is fourth time born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Father in heaven, we come before you to pray, Lord, now for this time of preaching and teaching, and we pray, O oh God, for Jeff Giddings, and we pray that you would give him recovery, doctors to have an incredible amount of wisdom to diagnose what's exactly happening in his body, in his brain, in his, in his neurological system. And Jeff's not alone, Lord. There are so many that are sick and struggling. And then we think about the war in Israel and the Gaza Strip and the West Bank and Ukraine and the craziness of the fallen world that we live in. We pray, Lord, for Mike Johnson, our new Speaker of the House, and we pray, God, that as an evangelical Christian that you would give him wisdom from the Holy Spirit to impact change in our government, that it might reward what is good and punish what is evil. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's review. Number one, from the very beginning, regeneration, born again, spiritual dead to life was needed to see and enter the kingdom of God. This is not a new idea. This is from the beginning. And by beginning, we mean Adam. We mean Eve. Number two, this was always a work of grace. Always. It's always been 
a work of grace. Anyone that's ever been saved, it is a work of grace. They are getting what they don't deserve. It is flowing out of God's mercy, out of God's grace. Number three, physical circumcision, Genesis 17, physical circumcision was an outward sign that was supposed to point people to their need for spiritual circumcision. And remember, spiritual circumcision is regeneration. That's what it is. Spiritual circumcision is when God does a work inside of you and you go from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive. Number four, the law of Moses was not written on human hearts. It was given on stone tablets. The law of Moses was given on stone tablets so that the law of Christ could be written where, church? On human hearts. On human hearts. Number five. God first dwelt with Adam and Eve. This is a big deal. This is huge in our worldview. Garden of Eden is the temple. What do you mean the temple? There's no physical structure there. Nor will there be a physical structure in the very end. God is the temple. And God dwelt with Adam and Eve in perfect harmony, no sin whatsoever. Sin giantly interrupts that. We call that the fall of man, Genesis chapter number three. And then God dwells with, God, uh, God dwells with man in the tabernacle, Exodus. And then God dwells with man in the temple, right? In the temple. What temple? This is Solomon's temple. He builds it and asks God, and God says, yes, I'll do it. I'll come and dwell. But it's not in Old Testament saints until the new covenant. Until the new covenant. Number six. Man has always been justified by faith. And the whole church should understand that justification is when you are declared. What's the right word here, church? Righteous, when you are declared righteous. If you're not saved this morning, you're spiritually bankrupt. You're, I can't use this. Uh, I was going to say writing checks that are going to bounce, but there's, I mean, how many of you have, you've never written a check? Let's just do a little (laughs) survey. How many in here have never written a check? Oh, it's not as many as I thought. I thought it was going to be a lot more. So, yeah, okay, so you used to be able to bounce checks before we had this digital world that we live in. You'd write a check and you have no money in the bank and then you could get something in return for it. Not a good idea. It was against the law. Um, You plead ignorance like I didn't know my check hadn't got to the bank or whatever the case may be. Uh, You're spiritually bankrupt. If you're not saved this morning, you are spiritually dead. You're spiritually bankrupt. You're writing checks that you can't cash is an old expression to try to somehow get you to understand what's happening here. But Jesus declares you righteous. So man has always been justified, declared righteous by faith in the promises of God. Always. This is your answer to the question, how did people get saved before Jesus? You're going to get asked that question by unsaved people. Well, you guys believe that Jesus saves. What about everybody before Jesus? And your answer to that question is those people who were declared righteous, justified, saved before Jesus, believed by faith in the promises of God. And the promises progressively pointed to Jesus. They got bigger. They got clearer. They got more specific. More details were filled in. Less Um, vagueness, more specificity. For example, think with me, Isaiah 53. Really specific. Lots of details. Now we really know who we're talking about. This is who we're looking for. Number seven. When we talk about born again, when we look at born again, we must make a distinction between born again prior to the cross, as in this way, and born again after the cross, as in this way. 
It was happening both sides, but it's different. And the difference is here. After the cross, the Spirit does not dwell in a tabernacle, does not dwell in a temple. Where's the Spirit now dwell? In the believer. And you become the temple of God. You become the walking, talking tabernacle of God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I'll quickly switch that. That's not how you spell it, so let me get that by by you. I, just an abortion of spelling there for a minute. So I've got a chart in front of you to take a look at. I've got the old covenant mediated by Moses, and I'm contrasting with the new covenant mediated by Christ. Now, the blue line or the slightly gray line is to remind you that we don't have two ways of getting saved. We do not have that. From the very beginning, every single human being has been saved by grace, justified by faith, and regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about Adam, whether we're talking about Malachi, whether we're talking about Nicodemus, whether we're talking about Paul, any of those four, and everyone in between. Now, where lies the differences? Well, what did Adam believe in unto salvation, and what did Paul believe in unto salvation? Adam believes in a promise from God, pretty small promise in the sense of not a lot of details. Becomes really huge with the apostle Paul. He has to believe that the man Jesus Christ of Nazareth was much more than just a man. He must believe that he was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, resurrected, ascended to heaven. It's a full and complete revelation. And everybody between Paul and Adam are believing in various degrees of promises until you get to the very end. And then nothing ever negates the need of the Holy Spirit to regenerate dead people. The Holy Spirit's been doing that from the very beginning. So now let's compare and contrast. In the Mosaic Covenant, physical circumcision is a really big deal. In the New Covenant, it's water baptism. In the Old Covenant, it's 80-year-old boys as a sign of the Abrahamic Covenant. In the New Covenant, it's water baptism for believers Males and females. In the Old Covenant, it's the law of Moses written on stone tablets. In the New Covenant, it's the law of Christ written the heart of, and really I could have said here, believers. Not every human being, believers. In the Old Covenant, it's a changing high priest. And the priests only come from the tribe of Levi. In the New Covenant, Christ is the eternal high priest. And every believer is a priest offering not physical uh, sacrifices, but spiritual sacrifices. In the Mosaic Covenant, it's the Passover. In the New Covenant, it's the Lord's Supper. In the Old Covenant, the Spirit of God dwells locally first in the tabernacle and then the temple. In the New Covenant, the Spirit indwells the believer as the temple of God. In the Old Covenant, the emphasis is on biological lineage. I am a son of Abraham. In the New Covenant, the emphasis is on spiritual what? Relationships. How do we see this? Do you remember when Jesus in the Gospels and mom's out here and they're like, hey, your mom's out here. You remember that? And he says, you, you, you. And he goes, there's my family. And it has nothing to do with blood. It's completely a spiritual thing. A blood of goats, sheep, and calves, the blood of the eternal Son of God, national Israel, the Israel of God, a temporal and continual atonement year by year, sacrifice by sacrifice. And then the book of Hebrews teaches us that Jesus is eternal, and the atonement he made was what? Once for all. Now, this is your Bible. You can't understand the transitional narrative of your Bible. You can't understand the story of creation, fall, redemption, new heaven and new earth if you don't understand the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. 
I wanted you to see how all this old covenant information right here was all set up to point us to the new covenant, to show us he's laying the foundation. This is the groundwork here for the new covenant. So now let's dig into this right here. We haven't talked much about this idea right here. Twice he says, see the kingdom of God and enter the kingdom of God. See the kingdom of God and enter the kingdom of God. What kingdom is Nicodemus speaking about to Jesus to Nicodemus about? What kingdom? Well, Peter tells us, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Peter uses this language. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of God. In this way, there will be provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom kingdom of God and the tr truth is church it's impossible to talk too much about this right. it really is church this is everything for us this is the end all be all of what we're about this is what motivates us this is what drives us this is what we are encouraged by this is how we deal with living in a fallen world. This is what sets Christianity apart from everything and everyone else. This is the dominant worldview for us. The belief that this life is just a small little thing. That there is something far more on the other side. That we are believing and living in such a way that we fully expect an entrance into the eternal kingdom. That's right. We recognize that life does not cease when you can't get a pulse anymore on me. That there is something more on the other side. This drives our train. It motivates us. It is the dominant aspect of a biblical world view. Entrance into the eternal kingdom is everything because of the alternative. And the truth is, the world that you and I live in is so biblically ignorant that they don't even believe that you still believe this. What? This. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. Listen to this hyperbolic language. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Church, that's impossible for us to think about. Could Jesus have said anything stronger? If your right eye is causing you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. What a vivid picture to get our attention. Why in the world would I do that? Why would I tear out and throw away my eye? Because it is better that you lose one of your members, then your whole body be thrown into hell. What is Jesus saying here? What is Jesus saying to us in this verse? He turns around in verse 30 and says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. I mean, this is something that we don't even believe anymore. Think about what he's saying. If there is anything that is keeping you from coming to Christ, tear it out of your life. Get rid of it. If there's anything that's causing you not to embrace Jesus as your Lord 
as your Savior, if there's anything interfering with your walk with Christ, get rid of it. Cast it out. Don't take any chances. It would be better for you to go through life like this than it would be enter hell. It would be better for you to lose your ability to do anything. We don't believe this. I mean, let's just be honest. We're struggling with this. Does your prayer life reflect that you believe this? Does your prayer life reflect that you believe this? You know how they say that your checkbook registry is an indication of what your priorities are? The way you spend your money is an indication of what your priorities are. I'm going to suggest to you that what you pray about is an indication of what you believe. This language is incredible. Do we think about this idea that everyone's going to be lined up? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, 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 no. What are you talking about? Turn to Matthew 25. Turn to Matthew 25. Jesus is not talking about something different here. This is the dominant thing that he talks about. Turn to Matthew 25. Look at verse 31, please. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And before him will be gathered all the nations. And he will separate people one from another as a separate separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. And then look at the language that it says here in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, you who are blessed by my father inherit, what's it say, church? The kingdom. the kingdom. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. There is nothing wrong with saying when I die, I'm going to heaven. There's nothing wrong with that. That is nothing unbiblical about that at all. But heaven is a small, short period of time. Because you're going to spend eternity on the new heaven and the new earth. Right. Your time in heaven is waiting until the return of Christ. That's your time in heaven. That's why it's sometimes called the intermediate state. Your ultimate destination is this new earth completely remade. If you have a biblical worldview this morning, you have to understand that the story of the Bible is a story of creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. New creation. And only those who are born again enter the new creation. Look down at your text and keep reading until you see the word depart. What verse number is depart? What number? 41. 41. 41. So in verse 34, the sheep inherit the kingdom. In verse 41, he will say to those on his left. This is hard for me even to read. You, you don't even want to communicate it because of how incredible it's going to be. Can you imagine growing up in a Christian church like this? Your boys, your daughter, these young men, your sons, Daniel, Samuel, hearing preaching and teaching like this, 
hearing Matthew 25 read and recited, and you never trust Christ, you never put your faith in Jesus, you never embrace Jesus as your Savior, you just do religion like your mom and dad have you do it, week after week after week. You grow up, you abandon the church, and suddenly you find yourself at the great white throne judgment in front of King Jesus, and you're standing on the left, and your brain gene is racing. I can't, it is impossible to me fully communicate to you what it was going to be like to be shaking there knowing that you've been taught what the Word of God says, knowing that this moment could happen, you did not believe it, you thought it was just a ridiculous idea perpetrated by men who created a fabrication of truth. And William, the word depart comes out of King Jesus' mouth and it begins echoing in your brain, depart, 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 depart. I never thought I was going to hear those words. Church, we are not taking entrance into the eternal kingdom serious enough. If you're not born again today, if you are not positively sure that you're born again, there is nothing more important for you to focus on for the rest of your life until you're born again. There's nothing more important. You ought to go to bed tonight saying, am I born again? You ought to wake up in the morning saying, am I born again? You ought to be asking yourself on a continual basis, is God doing a work in my life to give evidence of being born again? None of us are promised tomorrow. None of us are promised the five o'clock service tonight. We're not promised anything. I go down Cliffdale Road to go home, and there's a regular occurrence on Cliffdale that there are bad car accidents on Cliffdale. You've seen it. And that's not the only road. We are not taking entrance into the eternal kingdom of God serious enough. And Jesus gives us the details beyond measure. And all the, all the authors of the Old Testament, uh, the apostles pick up on it. Listen, my beloved brothers, in James chapter 2, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom of God, which he has promised to those who love him? Do you love Jesus? First, Second Timothy 4, 8, Paul says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed, and he will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Ephesians 5, 5, For you may be sure of this, everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is an idolater or is covetous has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. None. Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Number one, sexual immorality. Two, impurity. Three, sensuality. Four, idolatry. Five, sorcery. Six, enmity. Seven, strife. Eight, jealousy. Nine, fits of anger. Ten, rivalries. Eleven, dissensions. Twelve, divisions. 13 envy, 14 drunkenness, 15 orgies, and things like these. I think Paul's serious. I think Paul's trying to get our attention. Will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, the men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 14. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. 
Now, church, there is a present aspect to the kingdom of God, and there is a future aspect to the kingdom of God. Let me show you what I mean. Here's tonight's preaching text tonight, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 in Luke. And I want you to see how they titled this in the CSB Study Bible. They said it was Kingdom Values. This is not eternal kingdom stuff. Pastor Sean, how do we know this is not eternal kingdom stuff? Because he talks about everyone who divorces his wife right here. There'll be no divorce in the eternal kingdom. This is right now. He's saying there are people in the kingdom of God right now. They're on the earth. And this is how they think. This is their values. These are the things that they value. They value marriage. They understand that marriage is defined as one man and one woman. They have a a right view of this. And and we're going to get into the depth of this and how Paul, I mean, Luke is using this as an illustration of this big point right here. And we're going to do that tonight. Turn back to Daniel chapter 7, please. Look at the promise in Daniel 7. And it's an incredible promise. Daniel chapter 7, please. He writes, I looked then in verse 11. I, Daniel, looked because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. Got his attention. He turned and looked. As I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. Verse 12, and as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away and their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions and behold, there was one there and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the son of man. This is why Jesus often refers to himself as the son of man right here. If you wonder why there's so much son of man in the gospels, it is because of Daniel 7. And the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days. Church, who's the Ancient of Days? God the Father. That's right. God the Father. And he was presented, Jesus was presented before him. And to him, Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and a kingdom that all peoples, all ethnicities, all nations, all languages should serve him. And what kind of dominion does he have? It's an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is one that shall not be what, church? Destroyed. Look at verse number 18. But the saints of the Most High, the saints, the the literal language is holy ones. The holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom Forever and ever and ever. Now the question is, are you there? Are you one of those saints? You say, I'm not holy. You're not? You're not? Maybe you need to get a right view of yourself. Has the Lord Jesus made you holy? Has the Lord Jesus set you apart? Has the Lord Jesus set you apart? Has the Lord Jesus set you apart? Have you been declared righteous? Have you been declared righteous? Have you been declared righteous? If the answer is yes, then you're a saint. This is not an invention of the Roman Catholic Church. This is biblical language. Set apart ones. Those that have been made holy by the Holy Spirit. And they receive, they inherit this biblical kingdom. Wait a minute, what are you saying? I'm telling you that verse 18, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever is the sheep that are on the hands of the Lord, the right hand, and they here inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. That Jesus in Matthew 25 is describing Daniel chapter 7. Now just imagine for a moment... Just create in your mind this morning Jesus on his glorious throne and that side is his right hand and that side is his left. 
And every single person in the church is lined up right here, out the door and into the parking lot. And we're going right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. And you see that a distinction is being made between sheep and goats. Can you just imagine Dr. Boyd being in the back of the line and seeing all these sheep go over here and you're wondering to myself, am I a sheep or am I a goat? And you're going to, at that moment, try to make yourself into what you can't be changed. Am I getting through to y'all at all? Are y'all able to see the picture that I'm in trying to describe for you? I can't fathom being back here. And you notice these people over here are immoral. And, and, and you're like, oh, man, I really, wow. And, 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 like, and you're getting up there going, am I going to hear right or left? You're walking up. Can you imagine this? You're getting closer. You're getting closer. You're getting up there. You're getting up there. Sheep, sheep, go. Sheep, sheep, go, go, go. <gasps> you say, are you trying to scare us? Yes. Absolutely. Unequivocally. Yes. Nicodemus was not one of the saints. He would not see, he would not enter, he would not inherit the kingdom of God because he had yet to be born again. Now, I believe that he is born again. I believe that later there's some evidence that he put his faith in Christ. I can't be dogmatic about it, but he seems to be very concerned about the burial of Christ later. So have you been born from above? You say, what must I believe to be born from above? You must believe, number one, that there is a God. Hebrews 12, 6. You must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Number two, you must believe that God sent his only begotten son to earth to pay for your sin. And sin is a transgression of God's law worthy of punishment. Number three, you must believe that Jesus is God's son. He's the father's king. He's the Messiah. Number four, you must believe that the king was crucified for your sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. So the eternal kingdom is more than heaven. The eternal kingdom has begun, but there's so much more left on God's eschatological timeline. Like what, Pastor Sean? Well, like the great tribulation, like the fall of Babylon, like the return of Christ, like the resurrection of the dead, like the defeat of the beast, the false prophet and the Satan, like the great white throne judgment, the destruction of the earth, the creation of new heaven, a new earth, and ultimately the new Jerusalem coming down to be in orbit with the new earth. You say, why are we talking about all this heavenly stuff? Because Jesus said he wanted to talk about heavenly things to Nicodemus. But he could not because Nicodemus would not believe the earthly things. You say, what earthly things are we talking about? What are the earthly things that Nicodemus would not believe? Well, number one, humans cannot see or enter the kingdom of God unless they've been born again. Nicodemus had some crazy idea about a second birth in his mother's womb, and he needed to be corrected. Jesus corrects him with this language. That which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. And this is where we're going to end this morning. I have this picture on the screen for you. These two pictures on the screen illustrate, in a simple way, the worldview difference between yourself, if you're a believer, and nearly everyone else. All right, what's going on here? For those listening on the audio, I have two pictures. I've got a huge elephant, big white tusk, great picture from Wikipedia. And on the other side, I have a, um, what do y'all think, seven or eight-year-old girl? I think that's about the right age, somewhere around there. And she's a cute little girl, and she's got some unique hairdress in there with some beautiful colors. The unbelievers that you associate with, the atheists that you hang out with, the, 
the, the bosses that you have, the co-workers that are unbelievers. This picture helps illustrate, these two pictures help illustrate the difference. Jesus said, that which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. And Jesus was making a clear distinction between flesh and spirit. But the vast majority of the world has abandoned that idea. What do you mean the vast majority of the world has abandoned that idea? If you go to a college class, the difference between that little girl, a college science class, that little girl and that elephant are years of evolution, and that's the only difference. Just years of evolution. The girl on the right is a highly evolved being, nevertheless still flesh. She is nothing but a container of bio stuff, like the elephant is a container of bio stuff. We, on the other hand, jump up and down. We argue vehemently. We are obnoxious about it. No, not true. That little girl is an image bearer of God. She has a spiritual component to her that lives beyond the grave. Yes, the elephant gets shot. Bury that elephant in a big hole. There's no soul. That soul's not going anywhere because that elephant is just what, church? Flesh and nothing more. But that little girl is completely different. In our worldview, Christ died for that little girl. In our worldview, that little girl has intrinsic value. Intrinsic. The value of that elephant is found in being alive. In the tusks that it has, in the capability of carrying something, transporting something, in its ability to attract tourists to come see it. But when that elephant dies, its value ceases to exist. But not that little girl. Her value is not based on her ability to contribute. Her value is internal. Because she's an image bearer of God. That which is spirit is what, church? Spirit. spirit. Now, why are you talking to us about this? You're trying to evangelize people concerning the spirit, and they don't even believe they have one. You're more concerned about their soul than they are because they don't even see themselves as spiritual beings having a soul. I am 58 years old. I'm a little older than a lot in this auditorium, but not as old as some of you. <laughs> we did a lot of evangelism in the late 70s, 80s, 90s. In our evangelism in the 80s and 90s, very seldom did we ever have a conversation about God. Because the assumption was everyone believed in God. We would ask questions about when you die, heaven and hell. Because even if they were unbelievers, they believed in the reality of a heaven and a hell. That's not the case anymore today, church. The number one religion in America growing just leaps and bounds is the nuns. N-O-N-E, no belief whatsoever. Don't make me religious. I'm not religious. Don't put that on me. Why are you telling us this? Because if you're going to talk to your Nicodemus, if you're going to have a conversation with your Nicodemus, the Nicodemus that you're concerned about, you've got to get them to understand that that which is flesh is flesh and that which is spirit is spirit. They must understand that there is more to you than what you realize. You are not a highly evolved being. You are a person made in God's image to whom Christ loved enough to die for you. We're going to get there, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's our next set of verses. But God commended, God demonstrated his love to us and while we were yet, what church? Sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't die for an elephant or a frog or a dog or your favorite cat. 
Christ died for humans. Why? Because only humans are made in God's image. And God, first and foremost, sister, is a spirit. A spirit. So part of the aspect in which we bear God's image is the fact that there is a spiritual component to us. But if your person, your Nicodemus, doesn't see that, you'll have to start there before you can get to the gospel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us, Lord God, to take the mandate that we have to evangelize the world seriously. Help us to take that mandate seriously. Help us to understand that we must equip ourselves to share the gospel in the world that you've called us to live in your divine sovereignty. To this generation that's abandoned a faith in God. To this generation that doesn't acknowledge the spiritual component of human beings. Lord Jesus, we love you. Help us to do it well under the influence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.